Yes, yes. Welcome to the ancient world of tabletop games. I am Agamemnon from the historical documentary Time Bandits. This is a report from a fugitive. Once I've wrestled a game out of a box, I make decisions about storing components. With a game that won't fit back into the box it came out of, that means reaching for additional plastic storage. How large is the game? What of the many components? Did the company include a detailed organizer built into the box insert? This is Gravity Superstar, and it doesn't need the usual compartmented box. It's a game with a reasonable amount of components and a handy box insert for storage purposes. This video is not an unboxing video. I don't do unboxing videos. Granted, I started this channel with an unboxing video, but that's a story from out of the Jurassic. I'll run through a few of the processes involved in getting a game ready for use. There weren't any cardboard sheets to punch out in this game, and thankfully, no game pieces that required stickers. Of all the types of game components out there, I think I hate the stickered plain piece most of all. So far, I haven't messed up applying a single game sticker. That is a run of luck that I'd describe as beyond supernatural. Mind you, I do my best to buy games that don't require the addition of stickers, so I'm guessing that run of luck will hold until eternity is done. On with the show. Rules, rules, and more rules. When I find multiple rulebooks, I break up that fight and separate them. If I don't find rules in English, I must away with haste to the interwebs where I hope to find a digital rulebook at the rainbow's end. The English language rulebook I keep handy at the top of the box when possible. Other language rulebooks head to the bottom of the box with the exception of the French rulebook, which is set aside for my French-Canadian collaborator, Melissa. I'll be sending Melissa a whole stack of French rulebooks in good order. Bonjour. Though I'm lifting the game insert out of the box to place rulebooks yonder, I'm also checking for loot down there. This video acts as a component check. Hefty games often have loot stashed under the plastic insert sections. This is perhaps most noticeable in the Dungeons & Dragons board games, with their cardboard counter sheets stacked neck deep under their plastic organizers. If there's a point against this game, then it's the tightness of the game boards against the plastic insert. Expect a little extra wear and tear prizing the boards out. Speaking of the boards, there are multiple boards with many configurations, boosted by the double-sided printing. All boards are present and correct. I'm not a fan of white text on darker backgrounds, but it is used sparingly in this rulebook, so we'll let that pass. Aside from that, I commend the rulebook as an example of how to lay a rulebook out. Games should provide a list of components, and here you have that list on the front page. And this video is a test of that list. We'll see if everything in the game is in the game. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You cannot trust game companies to put all the components in the game. Worse than that, you can't trust game companies to provide an accurate list of those components. What can go wrong? Missing rulebook. Components that aren't there. Plot twist, extra components included by mistake that will mess the game up if you don't notice the error. Duplicate of one card in place of another card that should be in the game but isn't. You name it, it'll go wrong. Yes, you'll find the correct types and numbers of assorted game components, but you might never know that the component list flat out numbers everything wrongly. The worst example I can think of came from a role-playing game book with an index that didn't match up to any entries. All the page numbers were wildly wrong. Luckily, I didn't buy that one. Board games fared better. The worst misplaced component I ever received was a rod of uranium-233 from a glow-in-the-dark version of Ludo that, for security reasons, was returned to the relevant covert research station. And that is a board gaming fact. The larger the game, the greater the nightmare in checking decks of cards. This game has one pack to unwrap. I found all the cards present correct and in good order. Worst example? A game of 
Kanagawa, in which one card had a square section of the back knocked out by the manufacturing process. Certain defects you'll shrug off, but the scraped layer gave away which card that was. The company immediately sent me a replacement card. Gravity Superstar comes with three bonus cards in this deck, and there's a one-sheet guide to those. Time to start filling the mildly thematic game insert. So far, the most thematic one I've seen was for Black Fleet, the insert being piratical in nature, forming a skull and crossbones. The cards all slot in there easily. I'm not a fan of games with card decks that brim over the edge of the insert. Here, that's not a problem. And it's never a concern if all you do is take the game down off the shelf and transfer it to the table. However, when you make house calls and the box is shuggling around in your backpack as you trudge along, you'll want to rethink storage for games that are jam-packed with pieces. In the case of these replay tokens, they are a tighter fit, and the top one in the stack almost spills over the edge. The tight game boards on top hold that stack in place, though. Are all the player pieces intact? Yes, they are. These are used lying down on the boards, raising a point. If you were short one coloured pawn in a game and you had many games on your shelves, would you go to the trouble of obtaining that missing pawn? Or would you replace the missing part with a spare piece from another game? Would you upgrade the pieces to something fancier? Depends on the game. Pawns don't lie flat without rolling and wouldn't stand in for these flat meeples, say. Always go after the missing parts? Difficult. If the game is out of print, I have enough spare parts for second edition Arkham Horror to stand the loss of a cardboard telltale heart token to the gap of the floorboards. This piece, representing an open door, is the likeliest to fall off a lively table and disappear into the dust. For ease of setup, I'm going to transfer it to another bag of components, one fewer bag to fiddle with when taking the game out or putting it away. And now the stars. Allotted to the rightful places in the heavens, they are all present, correct, and twinkling away in the right shades and proportions. Though they live in that silver bag, this is not a bag-building game in the strictest sense. The bag is an important opaque item used as a randomizer during game setup. I dispense with the plastic bag the stars arrived in. Excess bags removed from games go in a crate of bags that I dip into when I receive a game that should have bags. Perhaps the point is overlooked at production, most likely on grounds of cost. Profit margins are particle thin. When you buy in many games, you won't be short of those bags. Here I add the door token to the player pieces and another bag heads off to the storage crate. With everything packed away, all is right in gaming heaven. I mentioned the rule book as a model of layout. Let's take a look at what I mean by that. Opening the rule book, we see set up right there at the start. Show me how to set the game up and I'll gain immediate insight into game flow. If you are brand new to gaming, this is a skill you will acquire rapidly, provided the first rule book you look at is any damn good. And this one has the book layout you'd hope for. There are bajillions of ways to handle snippets of information, sidebars, even multiple rulebooks. Here the game employs red sections for important points. I don't object to white text in moderation. Just don't turn your whole sci-fi rule set into a white on black eyesore purely for reasons of science and fiction. Very quickly, we are almost at the end with a section on an optional part of the game. Finally, we turn to the much-abused last page of the rulebook, Game Designers. Please don't put stunning art on the last page of your rules. Do it this way. The back page talks about ending the game, and then there's an at-a-glance section designed to keep you right as you play. It's better to have a reference card or a back page that fulfills this function. Okay, in this case it is difficult to have your head stuck in the rulebook for hours given the brevity of the rules, but look for this type of reference at the end of the rules. The turn order, game flow, handy rules guidelines made clear, anything that provides help at a glance and keeps you from thumbing through a booklet looking for runic guidance is a good thing. Oh, and show the game on the back of the box. 
there are still people out there who buy games in physical shops or at conventions instead of online, and they want to see what the game is about in an instant. It'll make or break a purchase. This hasn't been an unboxing, except perhaps by accident as we went along. I checked the game. Everything was there. No need to add additional storage. Job done. If only all games had as little preparation as that. But then... Where would be the challenge when herding the bulkier gaming monsters onto the shelves?